Hello and welcome to my look back at some of the best road bikes launched in 2021. I thought before we all wind down into a festive period and start indulging in mince pies and other tasty food, we a time to look back at some of the highlights of the past year. So in this video, for road bikes, there will be one on gravel bikes, mountain bikes, and also my awards video coming later this month as well. So plenty of reason to hit that subscribe button down below. Now, before we dive in, this video is sponsored by Pedalshore, the insurance company that makes it quick, easy, and affordable to get your road, gravel, mountain, or e-bike insured against theft or accidental damage. So head to the website down below, link in the description, and get yourself an instant quote, and there's even a chance to get a free hip lock as well. Okay, let's dive in. This video is in no particular order, and I'll let you do the ranking down below but perhaps the most controversial, radical, and striking new bike launch in the past year is of course the Ribble Ultra Aero SLR. And it's a bike, when it launched back in the summer, that had me questioning, wondering aloud, if we'd reach peak aero. By which I mean, have all the aero gains over the last 20 years, which are generally good, because an aero bike is fast, in my experience, compared to a normal bike, have bike brands like Ribble now stepped across the line pushing aero too far and forgotten that a bike needs to look good as well. Because as much as I want the speed from an aero bike, I want it to look good as well. A bike I buy with my heart as well as my head. So it's a bike that definitely uh, gets people questioning whether aero is too extreme and it is the most extreme aero bike I've ever seen. And it'd be interesting to see how other brands respond to this over the next 12 months and whether it's a direction aero bikes are going in or whether it's an outlier and most bike brands won't go that far, remains to be seen really. And it's a bike that really pushes at the boundaries of the UCI rulebook. We've got a really distinctive aero handlebar, so really narrow as well for a start, really curvy, designed to really minimize the drag around your upper body, designed in unison with your body, and they claim it gives a 20% drag reduction over a regular aero handlebar. So 20 seconds, if you're racing, not to be sniffed at, but if you're racing to the cafe, probably not the biggest difference at all. So the rest of the frame is a bit more conventional in the looks, but definitely takes all the aero boxes. So drop rear stays, got that seat tube hugging the rear wheel, got a very deep profile down tube and head tube as well, cam tail profiles here and there, everything you expect from a modern aero bike. But it's a handlebar that really kind of sets the benchmark high for where an aero bike could possibly go, but probably going a step too far perhaps. I mean, if their claims are to be believed, it's definitely a far setup. But would you ride that bike? Is it a bike you could learn to love in terms of how it looks and not just a performance on the road? Well, let me know what you think down below. One thing going for this bike though is that the prices are relatively affordable. If you go for the version with a normal level five handlebar, prices start from just over 3,000 pounds for a one of five group set. So it's a more affordable, more attainable aero bike than we have seen. So to get all this cutting edge technology, and all this uh, work gone into this aero bike, but at a price that isn't quite as high as we're used to seeing from aero bike brands, um, that's definitely something to be applauded. Unfortunately, I haven't seen a bike in the flesh yet, let alone ride one, so I can't comment on how it rides and performs and whether it's as fast as they claim it to be, but hopefully next year that will all change. The Pinarello Dogma is one of the most successful race bikes of recent years, and this year we saw the new Dogma F. So it dropped the number, so it used to be 10 and then 12, and rather than 14, they've gone to F, and I guess F stands for fast. Let me know what you think it stands for down below. In my opinion, they should drop the F and just call it a dogma, like a tarmac or a TCR, just call it a Pinarello dogma. Doesn't need a number or a letter after it. Anyway, name aside, it builds on the solid foundations of the F8, F10, and F12, but a few refinements here and there, mainly aimed at reducing the weight of this bike over the old bike. So the frame itself isn't actually any lighter than the old bike, about 850, 860 grams for a size medium frame, I believe. But the weight savings come from a new headset assembly, a new handlebar, one-piece carbon handlebar and stem, new seat post, and a new 3D printed seat clamp. So a few savings here, really nibbling at the edges of the uh, frame components to try and make the whole package lighter rather than try and focus on making the frame lighter. Although 850 grams isn't light, when you look at the 700 grams or thereabouts of other top end frames. So I'm sure the frame could be lighter. I'm not really sure why it's as heavy as it is. The rest of the frame is largely the same as the old bike. 
still have that asymmetric frame design designed to handle forces from pedaling and from sprinting and so on, so we're twisting under load. We have the same seat stays which are a little bit dropped and then the down tube is largely the same but the flat back profile is a bit different to the old bike designed to shield the water bottle uh, from air coming around the down tube. A few other minor changes but put it next to an F12 and they look very similar. Like I said at the beginning, no bad thing but it is uh, a good looking bike generally for the most part. The other big news with the bike and it's a bit of a shock really to be honest is that one of the few top end bikes still available with a rim brake option alongside a disc brake version. We're seeing many bike brands like Specialized, BMC, Cervelo, Trek go to disc brake only on a top end model and totally abandoning rim brakes, but Pinarello aren't. I do wonder how much of that down to pressure from Team Ineos Grenadiers to retain a rim brake model alongside that disc brake version. I suspect it's quite a large part of why Pinarello is still offering a rim brake version while all their main rivals are only offering disc brakes. And from what I've heard from the bike trade, and there aren't many Pinarello Dogma F being sold yet because there are supply issues, the most customers are leaning towards disc brakes. But we've seen Team Ineos Grenadiers dabbling with disc brakes, most notably at the October edition of Paru Bay. But since then, we've seen them back on rim brakes. And I suspect they'll be on rim brakes and disc brakes as they want to during 2022. So while the rest of the Pro Peloton are going fully in with disc brakes, it appears Ineos Grenadiers are retaining their use of rim brakes where they want them. So maybe for different races or uh, rider requirements. So the Dogma Air definitely stands out for still offering a rim brake version. Now, unfortunately, the Dogma F is another bike I've not yet ridden. I mean, I tried, I've asked, but supply issues have been really, really tough for Pinarello. Even getting the customers on these new bikes has been tough for them. But hopefully next year, I'll get a chance to ride one and see if it's as good as the F12 and the F10 that came before it. And the other question is, if you're buying a Pinarello Dogma F, would you go for disc brakes or rim brakes? Let me know down below. Sticking with the aero theme, another radical new bike launch this year is the Orbear Orca Aero. And I do have one of these on test and there is a review coming on my channel very soon. So the new Orca Aero is a second generation aero bike from the Basque based company. And where the previous bike looked like a normal road bike, a fairly soft aero bike, this new one is anything but soft and it's had a major update and it looks unlike the old bike in so many ways. So lots of sharp lines, sharp angles, really defines the look of the bike and the frame itself has all the aero features you would expect. So a really deep profile down tube, cam tail profile, really hugs the front wheel like a time trial bike. The seat tube also hugs the rear wheel as well to make sure there's no drag at the back of the frame. Very deep profiled head tube and the fork blades as well. And then we have a two piece aero handlebar and stem which lets you swap the handlebar or the stem for another item. So unlike the one piece carbon handlebars you often get on aero bikes, you're not tied into that system. So if you want a wider or narrow handlebar or a shorter or longer stem, you can change that. So the way Orbea implements the internal cable routing is very neat on this bike. I've got one on test, I've taken it apart and it is very easy to uh, disassemble and put back together and looks really smart as well. And so far I've had no issues with it at all. The other big talking point with this bike when it launched of course is the aero water bottle and the aero toolbox on the belly of the down tube, the likes of which are not seen on any road bike and something you expect on a time trial or Ironman bike where fuel compartments and hydration compartments on the bike are fairly standard, but on a road bike, not so much. Now, thankfully you can remove them and fit a normal water bottle. And in my opinion, the bike as you picture show looks much better, much cleaner without these accessories fitted. But if you're in a pursuit of maximum aero, the company says the bike scores even better in a wind tunnel with these bits fitted than without. That aero toolbox does have merit though. I know it looks odd, but the idea of having all your tools and spare tubes and stuff nice and low in the frame for low center of gravity is a good thing. It's much cleaner looking than having a tool bag on your saddle or in your pocket. So save your pocket space for more food or clothing, especially at the time of year. And it's more aero as well. So if you get past the looks, it's not actually a bad idea. And I've been using it and it does work pretty well. So the Orbea Orca Aero is a radical looking new aero bike with some radical features and it does ride very well. My review is coming very soon, I promise. But I can tell you now the bike is really, really fast and definitely faster than a regular road bike like my giant TCR, for example. The handling is really good. The comfort is pretty good. Not the smoothest in the world, but not totally unsmooth and not uncomfortable on the long ride. 
so it does work really well as an aero bike and looks, like I say earlier, better without all the aero accessories. Right, let's have a break from the carbon aero bikes for a moment and look at the brand new Fairlight Strail version 3. Now, I do have a soft spot for Fairlight cycles, I have to admit, and you might have heard my recent podcast or seen the video on that podcast, link down below in case you missed it, with the founder and the brains behind the bikes, Dom Thomas, definitely worth uh, an hour of your time. Really interesting and fascinating conversation around the design of the bikes. So the Strail is the company's all-round road bike, a four-season road bike, put mud guards on for winter, wire tires for summer sporties, lots of comfort, very refined ride quality and a fine looking bike as well. And Australia was a bike the company launched with back in 2017 or thereabouts, a few years ago. So this is version three. And while on the surface it doesn't look very different to your bike, there are quite a few fundamental changes and it really shows how they're evolving and finessing each model with some nice updates while retaining everything we liked about the old versions. Now, the first point of order is that the company has moved manufacturing from Europe, where the frames were originally made, out to Taiwan. And this isn't, as much as you might believe it, about profits. And the company they used to make the new Strail was the only one with the manufacturing know-how to make the brand new chainstays, the curly-whirly technical term chainstays that are a key feature on the new bike and give the bike looks like I've not seen on a steel bike before, sort of curvy shape you expect from carbon, not steel, and give even smoother ride quality than a bike that was already buttery smooth. So improved ride quality, amazing looks, and really shows how the company is trying to push steel as far as they can and not be held back by you know, the usual limitation of steel, whether it's the tubing supply or the manufacturing ability of the company using to make the frame. So brand new chain stays, lots of aero refinements as well, lots of carryover details from the old bike, like the amazing Reynolds 853 oval top tube and down tube. We now have a brand new carbon fiber fork with internal dynamo routing. Put a dynamo on the back as well, so great for winter riding. You want lights on all year round with no batteries to worry about. And there's increased tire clearance up to a 37 millimeter wide tire or 35 with mud guards as well. But the same tried and tested geometry available in a medium or a tool for each frame size. So that is really worth talking about. Each frame size comes in two stack heights and that sort of level of customization you don't get from bigger bike manufacturers. So a nice improvement on a bike that's really very good. And a bike I would definitely own if I had the space. I don't, it's just too many bikes everywhere and the money, I don't. Um, and I know I'm biased here, but what I like about Fairlight is how they're one of the few brands really pushing steel as far as they can, not being held back by the limitations of the material and really doing some exciting things with it. And now back to carbon fiber with the brand new NV Custom Road. Now when NV, the company best known for wheels, handlebars, stems and other components, announced they were doing a road bike, I was surprised. But then I thought about it a bit more and I wasn't surprised. Because they make wheels, they do all their aero testing, so why not make a frame as well? And in a roundabout sort of way, they already do frames. I mean, they make tubes that other brands like Parley and Alchemy have been using to make frames. So why not make the whole thing in-house? And that's what they've done. So the custom road, as the name suggests, is a custom road bike. Not quite as custom as a bespoke frame builder would make for you. There are a set of limitations or parameters you work within, but you start with your bike fit and then they tailor the bike for you. So the frame is handmade in uh, Ogden, Utah with a base, and they use a tube to tube construction like Parley and others, which allows them to make a custom frame. Nine parts for each frame, so they customize head tube angle, seat tube angle, and all the other uh, key features on the frame. And then there are two flavors available. There's race and all road. And race is basically more aggressive, lower, longer, and then the all road is a more relaxed, uh, laid back option. They both have wide tire clearance, up to 34, I think. Uh, disc brakes, internal cable routing, got a brand new Chris King headset as well. One piece carbon handlebar and stem. And I got to see one of the early bikes in the UK in the flesh a few months ago. And trust me, it looks absolutely stunning in real life when you get up close to it and really appreciate all the details on the frame. And perhaps not the most radical looking aero bike, but I think it's a smart looking bike. Nice smooth frame features, not as sharp as that Orbea I showed you earlier. Not as radical as that Ribble, which is probably a good thing. So a classy looking bike with all that custom option and custom finish, I think it'll be a, a bike definitely proved popular with those who can afford it because it's not a cheap bike at all. And so to the last bike in the roundup, 
the brand new Cervelo R5 and easily the worst kept secret this year. I mean, we saw it being raced to victory in quite a few races in 2021 before it was even announced. So now it's been announced, we know all the details on a new bike. And with new bikes, we all expect the usual um, marketing guff, don't we? So lighter, stiffer, more aero. Well, the Cervelo R5 is a bit unusual in that firstly, they made it less stiff than the old bike, which is not something we usually hear of. Usually frames are stiffer by a defined percentage, but this one apparently is less stiff because the old bike was too stiff, calling the feedback from customers and the pros. So it dialed back stiffness, made it softer. How unusual. It is however much lighter than the old bike, down to just over 700 grams, which is as light as some of the lightest bikes in the market at the moment, like Trek and Monda and a few others. Disc brake only though, no rim brake version. And most of the weight savings come from the frame, but also the hardware on the frame as well. The bike is more aero than the old bike, as you'd expect, but not due to the frame itself, which looks very similar to the old bike. Very similar truncated rounded down tube, no drop rear stays like we're seeing on many aero race bikes, but mainly due to a brand new handlebar and stem. All the cables and hoses internally routed for clean lines, and according to Cervelo, a 25 gram drag reduction. So a less draggy bike than the old bike, mainly due to the new handlebar and stem, not the frame itself. And the way Cervelo is pitching this bike is quite interesting and quite different to other bike brands. So for example, you have the Special Tarmac, which is both lightweight and aero, same with the Giant TCR. And we've seen a Trek Amanda, a previously very lightweight bike, being given an aero makeover. But what Cervelo is doing is calling this a climbing bike, a lightweight climbing focused bike, where weight and that stiffness balance is really key to the bike designed to give their Grand Tour contenders, and they do have some really Grand Tour capable riders on their bikes this year and next year, give them the best climbing ability in the mountains. So an interesting uh, pitch really, because we've seen bike brands move away from that obsessive focus on weight and climbing lightweight bikes to more kind of all rounder bikes which are aero and lightweight. So an interesting move. Now, I haven't ridden this bike yet. Hopefully next year I'll get the chance. Hopefully the world will be back to normal next year and supply issues will be better. So I'll get my hands and legs over these bikes and see how they ride rather than sitting here talking about these bikes uh, while rain hammers down outside. Anyway, some of the best, most exciting, most interesting new road bikes launched in the past year. I can't wait to see what 2022 has in store. More aero, I guess, more lightweight, more disc brakes, more integration. I can't wait to see what the new year brings. But for now, let me know which of these bikes floats your boat or what bikes I have missed by leaving a comment down below. That's all for now. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you all again very soon. Thanks for watching.